Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm John Richter, and it's my pleasure to uh, be moderating uh, this panel. Uh, today, uh, we have a distinguished group uh, that will be covering uh, the criminal law topic for this year's Federal Society of National Lawyers Convention, prosecutorial discretion, partisanship, and the rule of law. In recent years, political uh, criminal investigations have occupied an enormous part of our national discussion. The special counsel investigation into Russian influence in the 2016 presidential election, the investigation into Hillary Clinton's email practices, and other high profile investigations have caused many elected officials and other commentators to raise concerns about the influence of political partisanship and institutional hubris and what that may be playing with regard to prosecutorial decision-making and the potential effect then on the application of the rule of law. Leaders in both major political parties have accused the other side of abrogating or undermining the rule of law for polar opposite reasons in the same investigations and cases. Commentators regularly express diametrically opposite views on the state of affairs at justice when it comes to whether and to what extent improper political or partisan motives have influenced certain investigations and decision-making. Given this national commentary, Americans reasonably can ask the question as to whether DOJ uses and can use its investigative and prosecutorial authority against political opposition, and if so, how should it be done and what should be done uh, about the present state of affairs. This panel will ass assess this national dialogue and the perceptions that flow from it and attempt to shed light on them by examining what the rule of law at the federal level means today, including the roles and responsibilities of political and career officials in federal law enforcement and the implications for inappropriate partisan influence, the legal and prudential limits of influence on the Department of Justice by the president and other actors in the executive branch, as well as in Congress, the lawful and appropriate scope of prosecutorial discretion, and finally, the role that growth in the breadth and coverage of federal criminal statutes may be playing in the present circumstances. We are fortunate to have, and honored, frankly, to have four extraordinary panelists to cover this topic. They're all well known, I would assume, to this audience. Judge Michael McKay, former Attorney General of the United States, Gary Grindler, former Acting Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Ken Weinstein, former Assistant Attorney General in charge of the National Security Division and U.S. Attorney. And Andrew McCarthy, former Chief Assistant United States Attorney in the Southern District of New York, as well as a noted writer and commentator. So I welcome each of them and look, we look forward to a dialogue today on these hot topics and conversations. To get started uh, and, to, and to set the stage, if you don't mind, uh, Judge Mukasey, I'll turn to you in the first instance and ask you whether and to what degree you believe that these conversations about these politically sensitive criminal investigations and prosecutions in recent years uh, raise concerns um, about partisanship and institutional hubris and whether these concerns and criticisms and observations are well-founded. Well, um, I can't speak to obviously all the, all the criticisms um, that have been made and all the, the conversations that have been held. Um, I can say that um, certainly um, it's appropriate to have the conversations. Um, I'm more concerned, frankly, with institutional hubris um, given what's gone on recently than I am with um, the, 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 the question of, of uh, uh, the limits of, uh, of what a prosecutor can and should do with respect to investigating, um, investigating uh, people who are perceived to be uh, political adversaries of, of the administration um, that's then in control. Um, obviously, the fact that somebody is an adversary uh, of, uh, of an administration does not confer uh, immunity on that person. Um, 
in addition, um, the, the, um, the, 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 one has to be very careful uh, in conducting not in conducting investigation, uh, not simply um, in, 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 in the result, but rather in announcing the existence of the investigation at all. Um, generally, um, the Bureau and the Department do not uh, disclose the existence of investigations until it's time um, to bring a charge or, or not. Um, I think that, that's, that we've had problems with that in recent years, um, largely but not entirely because of leaks. Um, sometimes it's impossible to proceed with an investigation without taking a step that finds, uh, finds its way into the press. Uh, but generally, one should avoid that. Um, if one avoids it, um, I see. I don't see that 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 anyone is limited um, in invest in conducting investigations uh, simply because the person being investigated is, is a political adversary. Um, ultimately, uh, the political appointees bear political responsibility for um, the existence of the outcome of an investigation, and um, so far as. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk at, about White House Justice Department contacts because we had um, some uh, perce perception of, of, uh, of impropriety before I took office. And uh, we worked out procedures uh, for uh, controlling that when I, when I was there. And uh, as far as I know, they've held up pretty well since. Thank you, Judge. Uh Andy McCarthy, uh, you've written a, a book, a bestseller, uh, seemingly entitled Ball of Collusion, The Plot to Rig an Election and Destroy a Presidency. Um, that's a, a rather provocative title. I hope, uh, I hope that's part of the reason your book has sold um, and, you and you chose it. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Are, is uh, is the, the criticisms and concerns uh, about politicization and decision making uh, beyond just institutional hubris, uh, what concerns do you have um, uh, as a as an observer these days? Um, I uh, yeah, a large part of the reason I wrote the book is because um, I hate being wrong, and for a long time. I maintain that uh, a lot of the uh, the central allegation, uh, particularly about uh, abuse of the FISA process, was wrong. You know, I had people who I had um, commonly worked with over the years on national security issues who were insistent that the uh, you know that basically a, a political opposition research screed had been. Uh, taken virtually in toto to the FISA court, and basically they slapped a caption on it and got FISA warrants. And I tried to patiently explain, as I observed the uh, tinfoil hats on their heads, that um, that's not how the FBI works, and that uh, you know what we'd ultimately find at the end of the rainbow was that uh, they will have gone through the information that they took in, because we take information from everyone, right? We take information from some of the worst people. It's necessary to do that uh, in some of the investigations of the worst criminal conduct. Uh, and what I told them was well, what would end up happening is that you will have gotten five or six or seven facts that they needed and the FBI would do what the FBI always does and, and go to school on it. And by the time they got to the FISA court, it would be an FBI investigation, not political opposition research. Uh, and of course, I turned out to be wrong about that. A lot of uh, what was used in the FISA court was uncorroborated, um, multiple hearsay, political opposition research. Uh, and it bothered me to be that wrong about something I thought I knew pretty well. Uh, and here I, I need to go back for a moment to the uh, 1990s, where we had a very robust argument. It's almost, it's so long ago and far away now that a lot of people have remembered it, but it was quite a thing at the time. Uh, and that was about the so-called wall, which impeded the cooperation between the um, 
the criminal investigation side of the FBI's house uh, and uh, the foreign counterintelligence side. And there was a lot of concern back then that the foreign counterintelligence powers would be used or could be abused uh, to basically steer criminal investigations under circumstances where there wasn't adequate evidence to have a criminal investigation. And you would just basically pretextually use these powers uh, until you finally came up with some criminal evidence, at which point uh, you could then pounce. There was a lot of concern back then uh, that that could happen. And at the time, it was really only conjectural. We didn't have any real evidence of it's happening. And I maintained, and this is what I'm uh, sort of annoyed at myself about, I, I maintained for uh, very vigorously that that just simply could never happen because there were so many rungs of approval at the FBI and the Justice Department that you would have to go to, go through, that um, assuming that you had a rogue agent, it would be much easier to fabricate the, the uh, fundaments of a criminal investigation and go the criminal route than try to fabricate a national security angle. And that turns out to be, to have been wrong. I think I owe an apology to the people who I made that argument uh, to in the 1990s, even though uh, we, we sadly felt pretty vindicated about it uh, after 9-11. So the only thing I can conclude from all of this is that we don't, we're not effectively, I don't know if we don't have the guardrails in place or if we have them, but we're, but they're only nominally uh, understood and they don't really, they're not effectively applied. But I do think, you know, the FBI and the Justice Department had a lot of bad luck in the last four or five years because some of these investigations, the Clinton emails investigation in particular, fell into their lap. It was unavoidable that they were enmeshed in the politics of the 2016 election. But uh, as far as the second investigation is concerned, uh, it, it seems to me that the, the safeguards that are supposed to be in place to make sure that abuses like that don't happen fail. And the most important thing going forward is not to keep using them against each other or continue this cycle. Uh, it's to try to figure out what went wrong and fix it. Gary Grenlow, you've served in two different uh, administration, Democratic administrations as a political appointee after many years as a career AUSA. How do you see politics and institutional hubris uh, in the present, uh, present Justice Department and the present atmosphere around it? And, um, um, and, what, and what do you see as, as uh, the dividing line, I guess, between legitimate investigation and prosecution of politically sensitive matters and inappropriate partisan motives driving investigations or prosecutions? Well, the, you know, one of the uh, most significant decisions that the Department of Justice uh, makes, I think, is to initiate the investigation. Uh, and the comment made about keeping those investigations confidential is of great significance because it's very easy for someone who wants to uh, embrace one political adversary versus the other can effectuate uh, uh, considerable damage by leaking information about an existing investigation. So I think one of the focuses that has to take place here is um, making the decision to initiate an investigation is critically important. It doesn't have with it the requirements even of probable cause at the outset of the investigation. And uh, you, you see that the public release uh, has damage. Uh, the, the investigation of the Clinton emails that was announced. Uh, many people have criticized that by suggesting that uh, that announcement was not appropriate uh, and it had impact and it was easy to do. Uh, 
Uh, so you have to think about that and the processes you need in place to try to go ahead and investigate those people that deserve to be investigated, regardless of their party, uh, and um, but protected from public disclosure. The timing of that particular matter was significant, of course, because you were in the midst of a presidential election. But you know that those are and on, on a smaller scale, we faced decisions about initiation of investigation during the political season where one candidate was trying to convince the FBI to um, initiate an investigation of the adversary, in one case, even to wear a wire uh, and have a meeting with the other candidate. And those decisions had to be made. Once made, though, someone was going to leak it. And uh, so the processes for that are very, very important. Ken, you served as the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the National Security Division. And, and uh, uh, obviously a number of these investigations have involved uh, intelligence equities and use of the FISA process as uh, in addition to, to other, other criminal investigative techniques. From your perspective uh, uh, and that vantage point, uh, how do you see uh, the department uh, putting in, I guess, and to what degree do you believe that the political and institutional hubris risks play a part in decision-making to open investigations, particularly where there are intelligence uh, equities uh, in the mix? Yeah, I think actually you put your finger on an important characteristic of some of the matters that have come to the fore over the last four or five years, which is that there's an intelligence dimension to them. And that complicates things in a number of ways because um, you now have in deciding what to disclose, what not to disclose, what to act on, what not to act on, which is always something that's heavily scrutinized either at the time or later on for the um, possibility of political influence. You then throw in the further consideration that you're dealing with very sensitive sources and methods that need to be protected, you know, in their own right. And so oftentimes then you'll have the relevant institution, whether it's an intelligence community agency or the Justice Department, um, either refusing to use or refusing to disclose information that American people might expect to hear in a criminal process because it's classified or it relates to sensitive sources and methods. So that's a, a different dimension that we've seen play out, especially in the Russia investigation. Um, and I think a, a different complication that arises from the the fact that there are sort of intelligence dimensions to some of these cases is that we're all accustomed, whether we're criminal lawyers or just lay people, we sort of have an understanding of the predication that's used in the criminal process. Probable cause, you know, preponderance of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. That's just something that we've internalized as a people. Um, and we use different standards when it comes to using uh, intelligence tools. And it's sort of be a gross generalization to say lesser standards, but we use different standards. I think Andy was sort of referencing that when he talked about FISA, that it's a different process to get a FISA, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act order, than it is to get an Article III wiretap. So Judge McKay reviewed countless wiretap applications as a judge. Um, I probably brought one to him myself. And, and, so, and, and it's intuitive to him as to what is required for that. It's different when it comes to FISA. And so one of the challenges has been as the FISA process has been publicly disclosed, the process that was that Andy has written about um, in the Russian investigation, people I think have been ill-equipped to sort of judge whether there was sufficient predication. And I actually think the department has done not a very good job of explaining you know, what that predication is and what it should have been. So these are just things to keep in mind that it's, I think it was sort of a perfect storm, this Russian investigation, in the sense that it was obviously highly political, highly antagonistic on all sides. It then, you know, um, because of that antagonism, you then saw the institution, you know, acting as an institution. You talked about institutional hubris. There's just the human reaction of institutions and their people. 
But then in addition, you had what is sort of foreign territory for a lot of people. And I think there was a somewhat of a lack of understanding. And so I'm glad, and I've not read your book yet, but I'm going to. So I'm glad you've teased this out because I think that would uh, that'd be a real service to the American people who are trying to make, you know, trying to really get a clear understanding of what did and didn't happen, you know, once hopefully the, the political smoke clears. I'll also tell you that I reviewed countless FISA applications as well when I, when I was AG. Um, and there was no problem with most of them. Um, I say most because one or two did get marked return to sender and um, one or two did get marked return to sender by the court. Um, it wasn't a question of denial. It was a question of what about this and what about that? So it was, it's an, it was an iterative process. I, I guess I, I would also, though, go back to the point of um, on predication. Um, here, here, I think, is what the, the difficulty is. And this is really more of a, a judgment thing than anything that you could capture in the most perfect regulation that you can write, which is we necessarily need to have predication at a low level so that we can we can act in circumstances, especially as Ken is talking about, in the in the intelligence sphere, where we're dealing with national security threats to the United States. We can't wait until things ripen before we act. So it necessarily has to be a low level of predication, but that creates a much bigger danger that you could abuse these powers in the criminal context without what would be the normal predication that you would have in a criminal investigation. And, you know, the other thing with criminal investigations, all, all of us who pursued them know, is that, you know, they're fairly finite in the sense that, you know, at a certain point, you either have it or you don't. And every case in a U.S. attorney's office or uh, the Justice Department broadly, but certainly in the U.S. attorney's office, uh, is competing with every other case for resources. You don't have time to, you know, string things out forever. You 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 know, you either pursue the case or you move on. Um, and if you have, if what you're, the thing they were concerned about in the mid '90s, which seems to have been the problem here, is that you would use the not only the low level of predication, but the but the the black box of everything being classified on the national security side to string out a criminal investigation under circumstances where it didn't really merit being strung out. And the thing that's supposed to prevent that from happening is I think adult supervision. I mean, we can write as many regulations as you'd like to write, but uh, unless you have people with good judgment who say, you know, this is not the kind of thing that we do, you know, we don't, uh, we don't take unverified information to the FISA court. We run it down before we go there. Um, you know, I, I just don't, um, I, I don't know what's to be done about the, the problem of pretextual use of the national security powers in the absence of having I think the lessons learned here have to be that there has to be some kind of a presumption against using that, using those powers in our political context, especially our electoral context. And there has to be higher guardrails or multiple levels of, of, uh, of supervision where we stop that from happening at an early time and make sure that we're not using these powers in a way that affect politics because it's not good. It's, it's, it's terrible for the politics, but it's also awful for the Justice Department and the FBI to be enmeshed in it. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's deal with, I guess, the constitutional dimension and, and the uh, sort of true uh, legal dimension of all this. We, uh, I think what I hear from the four of you who uh, sort of range across uh, uh, the political spectrum a bit, um, but all, all obviously DOJ uh, alum, uh, is that you all believe that politics should not play a, 
and partisan politics should not play a role in decision making and that good uh, good judgment uh, is critical uh, in in terms of discerning what's a good investigation to begin and what's what's not uh, as a theoretical matter. Obviously, Article Two of the Constitution vests all executive power in the President of the United States, and um, presumably that means that ultimately, the, as a constitutional matter, all prosecutorial power emanates from uh, from the President. Um, and resides with the president. Um, uh, Judge Mukasey, you talked a little bit about some of the of the limits uh, that you observed uh, uh, during and when you came aboard as as attorney general. There's obviously a history stemming from uh, po the lessons post Watergate. But let me just start. Is there a distinction between the legal limits of presidential influence on the Department of Justice? and prudential limits on, on uh, the power of the president? And, and if so, uh, where do we draw that line as a legal matter versus a prudential matter and why? Um, I don't know that it's possible to draw a legal line. Um, the, um, the, as you said, the article two puts the executive power in the hands of the president. And when the attorney general exercises authority, he's exercising the president's authority, not his own. Um, one, the, 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 the only way to, 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 uh, to assure that the decisions um, that are made are made with, with, um, with reasonable safeguards in place is to assure that when, as, and if there's any attempt um, by a president uh, to, to get into uh, a particular case, that that goes to um, the people who within the department who are politically responsive, responsive, um, and that they deal with the president on that basis. Um, they will either pursue something or not pursue it, um, depending on their on their inclination and their ability to withstand the pressure. Um, in an extreme case, obviously, they can either resign or be fired. Um, just to to put a bit of a point on it, I um, I did get one such um, request uh, to show up at the White House to answer for something in a particular case, um, and I did, and we had a conversation. Um, it was not with the president; it was a mem with a member of the staff, um, and uh, it was clear that that person was talking for the president. Um, and I went back to the department, and we proceeded as we had before. Um, I didn't get fired. Um, so, um, that I think is the way it's supposed to work. Gary Grinlow, you served as the, uh, principal associate deputy attorney general, at least, uh, my, uh, memory is, uh, that, uh, in many instances, uh, the deputy attorney general and particularly the principal, uh, associate, the pay so-called pay DAG, uh, serves at least under some of the prudential uh, norms uh, at in the department as the go-between, if you will, uh, between the White House and political and the and the and the political powers at the White House and the department. Um, how is it? How has that worked and not worked in your observation uh, over the years? And to what degree uh, is that? I guess enough of a of a governor, if you will, on ensuring uh, the right balance between political accountability to the American people and uh, prosecutorial, the exercise of prosecutorial discretion free from uh, partisan influence. Well, as, uh, as you know, there, there is a memoranda that has addressed the communications between the White House and the Department of Justice. And then my experience, it was uh, pretty much adhered to. Uh, I mean, we would have discussions about public indictments and prosecutions uh, in terms of what is public, but in terms of investigations, we were pretty scrupulous to avoid discussions with exceptions. And one of the big exceptions is national security issues. Uh, 
a investigation, espionage investigation that's going to have a direct impact on the relations with another nation or even circumstances in which um, a prisoner exchange might be something that's important to consider uh, or uh, an indictment that's going to come down that will have some profound impact on the financial markets. There were exceptions where some disclosures were made of pending matters, but it was rare. And there seemed to be a respect for that. And uh, uh, so I was, for the most part, satisfied with, at least in my experience, uh, the adherence to getting involved with the White House when the case really implicated, you know, serious interests of the United States that the president should be involved with. Um, but in the overwhelming majority of cases, we would uh, not talk about them. Uh, Ken, in terms of from an NSD perspective, it with an exception that an exception that essentially uh, allows national security implications to potentially, uh, I guess, uh, uh, sort of reduce the threshold for communications with the White House and the presidency. Um, and given the, the recent investigations that seem to arise in that context, uh, is should that that, I guess, exception to the general rule be examined? And if so, uh, what do you do about it, given the importance of national security, uh, but uh, given uh, the, the importance of, of, I guess, normatively speaking, of keeping some distance uh, between uh, political actors and uh, the exercise, you know, and prosecutors who are exercising uh, judgments in uh, particular criminal investigations and cases? Yeah, look, it's a good question. And the traditional rule, the, the memo that has been sort of uh, put in place that Gary referenced, um, and it's primarily designed to prevent the White House from calling over, any White House from calling over and saying, hey, I understand you're investigating Congressman Jones, Congressman of our party out in state X. Why don't you just not pursue that investigation? Uh, we really think it's not good. Obviously, that's the kind of communication you don't want. And that's usually in the criminal context. Especially after 9-11, it became very clear that that kind of barrier uh, to communication, and it's you know very structured, it goes through a particular, whether it's the pay bag, it used to be the iconic David Hurdle, um, who was the person designated to sort of receive input about ongoing matters from the White House. Um, there's a, a process that's to be followed. It just doesn't work in the national security context. And post 9-11, we, you know, we really saw why. So Andy talked about the lowering of the wall after 9-11 that had separated culturally in many ways, uh, regulatorily, but also by practice, the intelligence assets of our government from the law enforcement assets of our government. And that was really crippling and helped to lead to 9-11 happening without us detecting it first, because like there were criminal agents from the FBI who couldn't share what they knew about terrorists who are, you know, criminal suspects, criminal targets. They couldn't share information with the intelligence agents of the FBI who were investigating the same people as intelligence targets as opposed to criminal targets. So that, that wall came down. There can now be sharing across within the FBI, but also between the intelligence community and law enforcement about these targets that they hold in common, like spies. You know, spies are an intelligence threat, but they're also criminal suspects. Terrorists, foreign terrorists, the same thing. Foreign cyber bad actors, the same thing. And that needs to be coordinated at the interagency level, which is run out of the White House. And in, in the classic scenario is if you have a hot threat investigation, let's say we've detected a cell here in the United States, um, the intelligence community might not want to take it down immediately because the longer you, you know, once you detect a cell, the longer you can monitor it, the more you learn only, not only about those bad actors, but the people that they're related to, right? So more, the longer you leave it out there, the more intelligence you get. Law enforcement might be looking at it differently, thinking, hey, we need to take these guys down. We have a case that we can perfect. We can put them away for 20 years each. 
that's a decision that has to be made at the interagency level. So that's about, that's, that's communication with the White House, oftentimes in the White House, in the Situation Room, about possible criminal charges where the political folks in the White House are fully engaged and need to be fully engaged. So I don't, you know, to the extent that your question goes to, isn't this a predicament? Isn't this a dilemma that we're trying to prevent White House influence on what could become criminal cases? And now we're seeing that happen in the national security context. So shouldn't we have some sort of prohibition on that kind of communication in the national security context? I just don't think that's doable. I think it's just so critical that we have that coordination. And I think one of the greatest things that's happened since 9-11 is that coordination, is the ability for, you know, the general counsel of the CIA to call up the, the head of the National Security Division, John Demers, and say, hey, let's talk through how we're going to manage this matter. We've got our agents, you know, we got our, um, we got folks looking at the, this terrorist cell. You've got FBI agents doing the same. How do we coordinate? So I think in, in, in short, that just isn't going to be feasible to do. Can, can, I, just, can I just say, um, I, I I was glad about two things about what, what Ken just said. First of all, the, the bit about no prohibition. I emphatically agree with that. I think um, my concerns are more along the lines of what, what can we do internally uh, to, to raise questions at a high enough level and go slow when um, there are competing concerns, with, especially with the, the law enforcement concerns. Um, but I'm not talking about any kind of a regulatory uh, prohibition at all. Uh, and the second thing, Ken mentioned culture, which is a great word to use in this context, um, because I, I, I can speak personally, not from the, from the uh, main justice angle of this, but from the criminal prosecution angle of it, I experienced culture shock in, uh, in 1993 when we were, ha we end up having an internal debate in the Justice Department about whether to indict the blind shake or not. And it was the first time, I mean, maybe it, maybe it co had come up as a, in a sliver in other cases I've been involved in, but this was the first time <clears throat> I had ever had a case where, you know, the ethos of the Justice Department is, uh, we're entitled to everybody's evidence and nothing is more important than our cases and nobody is above the law and we love to say all that stuff. And, and I think, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time it's true, but you, you suddenly find that there actually are other considerations and they are not only legitimate considerations, they're serious national security considerations that are more important than prosecutions in some contexts. So when we had to have this debate about whether to bring charges or not, it wasn't just a matter of whether we had enough evidence to charge. Uh, it turned out that we had to look at both, not, especially on the State Department end uh, and the intelligence end, what was the benefit versus the, the downside to the United States of bringing these charges under these circumstances and what interests of ours, particularly security interests overseas, were going to be affected if we, if we went ahead with the case. And the only reason I raise this is, I, I think, and I, it seems to me that this is uh, evident in um, a lot of, certainly the coverage and the commentary about the investigations over the last few years. Um, there is an ethos in the Justice Department that nothing is more important than our prosecutions. And again, most of the time that's true, but I don't, I don't think that we're sensitive enough to number one, how much these investigations compromise an administration's capacity to, to govern when they're corruption investigations that are aimed at uh, the administration. And secondly, it simply is a fact that even if you're not talking about uh, executive corruption, there are a lot of interests that are at stake that we have to deal with that are more important occasionally uh, than our prosecutions. And I just don't think that we necessarily do a good job of, uh, of 
communicating that? So um, let's talk about uh, some remarks recently that Attorney General Barr made uh, in September uh, at Hillsdale College. And in his remarks, uh, he made really two points um, that I wanna highlight here. Uh, he first said that the most basic check on prosecutorial power is politics. Uh, and he said, it's counterintuitive to say that as we rightly strive to maintain an apolitical system of criminal justice, but political accountability, politics, is what ultimately ensures our system does not does its work fairly and with proper recognition of the many interests and values at stake. Um, and he spoke and, and then said, the men and women who have the ultimate authority in the Justice Department are thus the ones on whom our elected officials have conferred that responsibility by presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. confirmation. That blessing by the two political branches of government gives these officials democratic legitimacy that career officials simply do not possess. Um, one of the uh, seeming themes of a lot of the commentary uh, that I've read in recent years uh, seem, would, would suggest just the polar opposite, that it's the career officials that are the apolitical players and whose judgment should be relied upon in these highly sensitive political investigations, particularly if the Justice Department is looking at political actors and particularly looking at, at, the, uh, uh, at, at per personnel in the White House. And yet uh, Attorney General Barr uh, certainly seems to be arguing that in fact, it is the political appointees themselves uh, of the department uh, that are uh, frankly the, the truest expression I guess, of the American uh, electoral uh, process and therefore the will of the American people. How do we square that uh, circle, uh, Judge McKaysey? Well, um, I think I come out entirely on the side of the Attorney General on this one. Um, it is possible for um, career people, however well-intentioned, uh, to become married to their cases and to their positions in those cases. Um, regardless of whether that happens or not. Um, I think that um, ultimately, uh, as I said before, the authority that's wielded here is an executive authority and the people who are uh, politically responsive and will pay the price politically if, if, if power is wielded uh, improvidently um, are the people who have to have ultimate authority. Um, to say that we're gonna delegate this to um, or, or, or prefer um, the, the word of career people, simply because they are career people, I think is a grave mistake. Um, Gary Grindler, uh, obviously two can tango here. Um, if, uh, you know, depending on where you, where you sit politically, you may be very happy uh, knowing that political appointees are making the decisions on a case. Then again, if if you're on the if you believe you're at the opposite on the opposite end of the political spectrum from those uh, political appointed officials, uh, you may fear uh, fear the worst. Uh, in your experience, how as a political appointee uh, do you manage for that, and and what can uh, the department do, the political actors, the political appointees in in the department do to um, try to avoid not only the substantive influence of politics, but the appearance of, of partisan uh, motive uh, in the situation in which they're being asked to make decisions in highly sensitive uh, investigations that involve po political players or political equities in some fashion. Well, I, uh, I don't know that I would have worded it the way the Attorney General worded it, uh, but I believe in the notion that the leadership of the department, uh, even in the context of making decisions in criminal matters, should be the ultimate decision making for sensitive matters should be with the politically appointed leadership. But I also and, and for the reason already stated that career 
prosecutors are not immune from having viewpoints on things, getting highly invest invested in a case or attracted by the potential notoriety of the case that could make them approach it more aggressively than is appropriate. So, but I think as political leadership, and I think it, it is a process that at the department that has worked, that you need to seek the input from the career line attorneys who have devoted their time and attention to the case, but to their supervisors, their career supervisors, and um, and up up the line because you you want to show and demonstrate that you're considering all of the factual and legal merits issues when you come to a decision. But at the end of the day, I think it was referred to as adult leadership. Someone's got to make a decision on these sensitive cases, and, so, and some of the issues are incredibly complex and difficult. Um, and, but I think that the process by which those decisions are teed up, or those cases are teed up for decision, is the way you get credibility, hopefully, with the career people and with, with the public. Um, Ken, let me let me uh, pose a, a, what I think is kind of a hard question. Uh, surveys that I read of about career DOJ personnel suggest that the majority of of DOJ personnel who make political contributions do uh, tend to do so to one political party over the other. Um, obviously such political activity is protected uh, uh, and the right of these uh, these uh, individuals uh, to have political views is is protected like any other American. But to what degree does that kind of um, free will behavior by uh, career personnel um, it, to what degree is that a factor that that may be rightly considered uh, a, by a supervisor in staffing politically sensitive investigations or cases? To what degree should that be ignored? How do how do we uh, address that uh, as as we think about um, politics uh, and the Department of Justice? Hey, look, that's a good question. So you know you get at sort of the, the fundamental issue here is you've got people who have decided political views and they are career people whose job it is to exercise prosecutorial discretion completely regardless of politics. And, you know, that's, uh, I think there is a sense in this country, and I think one of the unfortunate effects of the last couple of years has been uh, a sense on the part of many that people cannot actually put their politics aside and do their job apolitically. Now, those of us, many of us on this call are longtime AUSAs who grew up in a culture which didn't consider politics. And especially in the big city offices, it's just, it, 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 it's, if you start talking, if you start acting and speaking in two partisan a way, it actually is sort of atonal. It doesn't work in a US attorney's office because People who are career folks pride themselves on not being political because they know how devastating it can be to the reputation of the Justice Department and the reputation of the office and the individual if you are seen as, as driven by, you know, things other than the facts and law that relate to that particular case. And I often say, now I was, I was the U.S. Attorney in the D.C. office, and that's probably the least political office in the country because it has the DA side. It does a lot of the street crimes and there's no political dimension to those cases. But you know, we had 330 prosecutors. I literally think I, and I was there for whatever, 12 years. I might know the political affiliation of about three of my friends. It just wasn't an issue that we discussed. I mean, we talked politics, but we didn't talk about our partisan loyalties. And so that culture still exists in DOJ and people still, I think, are proud to believe in it. And I think. Actually, it's one of the underpinnings of morale in DOJ that they the, that prosecutors and all staff sort of feel like they're doing things that are God, it's God's work. It's based on justice and not based on 
the whim of one person or one person's political predilections. That being said, to your question, you can't ignore the fact that somebody might have political leanings and make sure, for a couple of reasons. One, you have to make sure that person is not going to allow his or her decision making to be influenced. And there are some people that try as they might, they cannot put their politics aside. But even more importantly, it's the perception. And it, it sort of foundational to the department's ability to have credibility and be effective is the public perception that is doing things based on the facts and law and is equal and blind in the way it dispenses justice. And if there's a perception that one U.S. attorney hires only Democrats or hires only Republicans or declines cases against Democrats, goes after cases that involve Republicans, that's going to catch up to them. And, you know, I think that a number of the questions that have been asked over the last, you know, 20 years since I've been really tracking all these political issues from campaign finance through the Hillary emails through the more recent ones. Um, the unfortunate thing is the, the belief on the part of some that prosecutors really cannot put their politics aside. I might be Pollyannish, but I actually believe that they can and that they largely do, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, so I would hate to see any kind of litmus test be applied to the hiring or staffing practices of the Department of Justice. We want people who are passionate about politics one way or the other. We just want to make sure they don't let that, I mean, because that shows that they care, right? It shows they care about our country. They care about the future of our country. They're therefore going to care about the mission of the department. That's fine. We just need to make sure that, that you know, that we are conducting very careful supervision and that the leadership, both career leadership and even more importantly, the political leadership are very attuned to the perception of politicization. And I'm, I'm worried that that perception is, has become ingrained and is being used sort of as a weapon both directions. I really worry about uh, the future of the department given that state of play. Andy, uh, you've been covering, I know, uh, through your regular appearances uh, on, the, on the John Batchelor show and been discussing a lot of the decision-making by prosecutors uh, in a number of the highly sensitive investigations that have generated such national discussion and debate. Um, to what degree um, could some of the criticisms of uh, the decisions and the decision making in terms of, of the perception of bias been avoided uh, based on your observations of the way uh, some of these uh, investigations were staffed and managed? Well, my experience, uh, not surprisingly, is the same as Ken's, which is that um, in the vast, vast majority of our cases, what we do is a professional clinical exercise. Uh, you know, we, we figure out what the law is, we see what facts we can prove, and, and that's the job. Uh, and, it, you know, having been a, uh, a conservative lawyer uh, in Manhattan, where, you know, virtually all my friends, uh, many, many of my friends in the office were uh, liberal Democrats, as Ken just said, you know, politics might be an issue when you're sitting around, a, you know, having a couple of beers after work on a Friday, but it, it doesn't have any bearing on the job day to day. And I had no problem in 20 years as a, as a prosecutor um, working with people who had very different political views than I did because that stuff got checked at the door and you do your job in the courtroom. But I think, you know, politics is part of, the, uh, of a, a bag of stuff that occasionally has a bearing because of the nature of particular cases. And it's not the only thing. I mean, a lot of times we have to do, um, because the appearance of impropriety is, a, is our standard for uh, maintaining the integrity of the, of the system. Uh, there's a lot of things that come up that can give you a conflict. It's not just your political attitudes. And we have to go through that in every single case where it could be, where there could be a perception problem. So it just seems to me that the rule of reason should apply that no one wants to say your constitutionally protected 
ability uh, or right to participate actively and vigorously in politics should at all be tamped down on, but you don't belong in a big political investigation then. I mean, if, if you have a situation where, um, you know, there's a fraught political nature to the, to the investigation, um, I, I, can, I can talk about this personally. Every now and then, um, because I'm out publicly doing, um, you know, the, the gas bag important work that I do, um, it, it, uh, my name gets bandied about when somebody needs a special counsel or, or at least comes up in public discussion that there should be a special counsel. And it's come up on Democratic investigations. It's come up in Republican investigations. And I always say the same thing, which is, um, first of all, I'm fortunate enough to be able to make a living without having to work. So what, what do I want to get involved in that for? Um, but more to the point, the public does not want a prosecutor in one of these fraught investigations who's been, who's been out in the peanut gallery telling everybody what they think of the case and what they, you know, where it's going. Even if you're trying to do that, and I do try to do this uh, in as, as fair-minded a way that you can do it and try to be neutral about it, you don't want a prosecutor who's been involved in that process. That's just, to me, that's just common sense. So I think that, you know, your political attitudes ought to be part of the the baggage that you bring to any case that that if it turns out to be a case where that's relevant, you either need to, to factor that in. And if you can't, if you don't, uh, perceive the need to recuse yourself, then somebody has to be in a position to disqualify you. But I don't think there should ever be a bright line rule that just because what we're talking about is constitutionally protected activity, that means we have to put it in the black box and we can't consider um, the prosecutor's uh, attitudes about that because we have a higher obligation to the integrity of the judicial process. Uh, and to make sure that the public perception of these investigations, which are the most wrought investigations that we're that we or among the most wrought investigations that we have to deal with, we have to make sure that that is on the up and up, and that the public perceives it as on the up and up. Judge Mukasey, you headed up the official corruption unit uh, back in your day. How, uh, and at the line level, and obviously as Attorney General, you you uh, oversaw uh, a lot of uh, politically sensitive investigations that were briefed up to you. Um, to what degree then do do career prosecutors and officials who have a public record of of a partisan leaning differ, uh, and should they be treated differently in any way in terms of staffing and decision making as compared to uh, the political appointees in such sensitive investigations? Well, obviously, I think it depends on the profile um, of, the, of the particular prosecutor. Um, although I should tell you that the, uh, the corruption cases uh, that I handled principally, uh, apart from one congressional prosecution, um, involved principally dishonest uh, law enforcement agents. Uh, that was official corruption in those days. Um, it's gone Obviously, it's matured to a certain degree since. Um, so far as assigning people, um, it again, uh, the, I think the, the, the tone comes from the top. And if the norm, as, as Ken described it and as, as Andy described it, um, is that you check that stuff at the door, uh, then uh, you should have no hesitation about assigning just about anybody. But obviously, people who have... Uh, a high profile politically uh, who come to a prosecutor's office uh, simply can't participate um, in, in politically sensitive cases, particularly those that engage uh, the activities that they've been involved in. That's just common sense. Also, we've been talking about um, guardrails and, and, and principles and regulations um, as if they were self-enforcing. They're not. Uh, you can draft the most exquisite regulation 
um, and it won't enforce itself. Um, you can speak of something as a guardrail. Guardrail is a, it's a nice image, but it's a passive um, uh, control that does enforce itself. Um, what we're talking about here are not guardrails uh, because there are, there are no processes that are going to enforce themselves. Ultimately, it's going to take people with, with, with good judgment um, who um, subscribe to the kinds of norms that, that Ken and Andy have been talking about. Um, and if they're not there, then all the regulations and guardrails in the world aren't going to do you any good. Um, Attorney General Barr also argued in his uh, Hill's Day remarks, um, made the point that individual prosecutors can become, quote, headhunters consumed with taking down their target, unquote. Uh, how, do, how, how, how does the department manage for the perception that that could be the case? And when is a zealous advocate uh, on behalf of a, you know, on, on behalf of the department in a criminal investigation, or frankly, in, in looking uh, at things from a counterintelligence standpoint, um, uh, cross over from simply a good faith uh, desire to ensure uh, that people are held accountable for unlawful behavior and a sort of inexhaustive, inexhaustive, uh, inexhaustible um, uh, investigation of an inv individual in search of a crime. Um, let me, I'll turn to you, uh, uh, Andy. I think you've obviously, uh, in some of your writings and commentaries, have, have, uh, uh, have spoken a bit on this. I, I, I think this goes back to what we've been discussing. And, and to me, it's more of a matter of, uh, uh, of common sense. If, if you have somebody uh, who's handling a prosecution, who's appropriately handling a prosecution, um, meaning uh, you don't have any reason to, to doubt or suspect you know, that there's any uh, political taint, there's no conflict of interest. Um, then I think you you if I'm if I'm understanding your your question correctly, I, I think you just you know you do your job zealously and um, you you do it measured by whatever the demands of the investigation are. Ken, you made the point a moment ago that you thought. You, you expressed great concern that there's perception uh, in the United States today that the department has not been exercising its authority free from political bias. And you're concerned about that institutionally for the department and frankly, for the rule of law in the United States. Um, how, how, do you, how do you address that uh, given that both the, I guess the partisans on each side of the political equation these days accuse the other side of engaging in basically the kind of the mirror opposite of behavior. Um, to what degree, uh, if, you, if, if, you, if we move into a, uh, if there's a new attorney general, should, uh, how does that new attorney general uh, write that, uh, uh, in a way that doesn't just simply come across as saying, well, we won, so therefore now we get to exercise our authority consistent uh, uh, with the way we like um, and ratify essentially only one side of the partisan, uh, the partisan perceptions. Yeah, look, that's a good question. And just to go back to my earlier comments, um, they were that I was concerned, I am concerned that the perception that DOJ is politicized uh, is very is and can be very damaging to the future of the department and its effectiveness and its credibility. I'm not buying into the idea that it is politicized, you know, under any type of administration. I actually think the culture is very strong. Are there places along the way where there are questions should be asked and maybe there are missteps? Sure, but I think largely, as we all I think have agreed, 99.99% of what we do, what the department does, is done apolitically. Um, but it is a, it's a very damaging perception. And the next administration, 
and every administration needs to be very sensitive to that um, because, uh, you know, it, that's sort of first order of business is protect the reputation of the department. And to give Judge McKay some credit, he had to deal with a perception that was uh, that had been created fairly unfairly um, of politicization of certain aspects of the department before he came in. And one of the things that I was uh, most admired about how he handled his entry into the department was he made very clear, regardless of what, what did or didn't happen before, whether it really was politicized or not, he, he went to great pains, at least as I saw it, to make it clear that he was about just doing the J-O-B, working with the career people. He was going to be politically responsive to the president, but he was going to make sure that everything was done sort of according to regular order. And that, that message got sent very quickly. And part of that was just character. Part of that was understanding the department. So the next person who comes in will have to do the same thing. And it's very important. But look, I, 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 you know, I guess I'm just sort of an eternally optimistic person. But I look at the department, I see, look, this, the career folks in the department get it, that they, most of, most of them get it, that there is, there is a political rank. And the political rank has the authority, in fact, the responsibility, the duty to supervise them. And so if the, the career people, um, you know, I, I decide, I think this is a charge that should be brought in this case. And the political person pushes back and says, no, I see it differently. At the end of the day, the political person, you know, the higher ranking supervisor gets to make the call. The attorney general gets to make the call. And so long as that, it, that call is made on sound, non-political uh, reasoning, then so be it. That's the, that's the way it works. And to, back to your earlier question, I think it is important to, to mention that, you know, some people have talked about how prosecutors get tunnel vision. They sort of get focused on their target, which means that they, they tend to see only the incriminating information and maybe not pay as much attention to the exculpatory information in, a, in an investigation. No question that happens. That's called human nature, right? You get set as a prosecutor, we're all type A people on you know, building a case. And the basic human instinct is to, to look at the, the information that helps you build the case more closely than the information that doesn't help you build the case. That's why we have you know, jobs of training in the department to make sure that we you know, turn over exculpatory information under Brady, why we're you know, constantly harping on the supervisors and their role at second guessing, the, not second guessing, but make, you know, supervising the prosecutorial decisions of their line people, because we all fall victim to that. And so that's why we need supervision. And that's why I, I don't really worry when I hear about you know, a decision maybe at the higher levels of the department countermanding um, a, a judgment at the lower levels, so long as it's clear there was a rational basis for it. That's, that's allowable. What is really damaging the department, though, is when a decision is made at the top levels, the political levels, it it overturns or or is that it, it takes issue with a career a decision of the career folks, and the explanation is not made as to why that was because that then undercuts the belief within the department that at the end of the day we're operating on facts and law and not on politics, and that gets back to the perception, and so messaging not only externally but within the department is so critical to maintaining morale and to the, maintaining the belief by everybody that we're about the facts of the law and not about politics. I'm going to take a minute here and, and uh, remind the audience uh, that they can get uh, continuing legal education credit uh, for uh, this panel presentation. The code, the password is And I'll repeat that near the end, uh, so uh, you can write it down again. Uh, Gary Grendler, uh, for a second. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Let's go back for a second to the the headhunter problem and uh, some of what uh, Ken was talking about. One way that we guarded against that in the Southern District of New York, and I don't know whether it's, this is done elsewhere, is to be very careful about um, not taking people right out of law school. Um, as prosecutors and to be very careful of the people we took right off clerkships. Because if somebody has grown up uh, for her or his entire life being told how smart they are and graduating magna cum this and summa cum that um, and never having to say please and thank you and never having made mistakes, um, those people can be dangerous when they become prosecutors. And I think a little bit of maturity, a little bit of kicking around in the outside world uh, is useful. 
I, 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 I second that. Uh, Gary Grindler, uh, uh, welcome back. I, I think we got you back on. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, we were, uh, as, as we look to, um, dare I say, it, it would appear at this point based on reporting uh, that uh, Joe Biden has prevailed in the election. That's obviously subject to some continuing debate, but assuming we're going to have sometime in January, a new attorney general, and given the fact that the partisans uh, certainly perceive uh, certain investigations um, has been, as having been politically motivated um, for mirror opposite uh, reasons. How should a, the next attorney general uh, address that, uh, recognizing that merely affirming uh, his own, uh, I guess, political party's uh, worldview uh, would have the effect of perpetuating this perception problem that Ken Weinstein mentioned uh, earlier, I think, before uh, you had some connection problems. Well, I think you go back to the fundamentals that we've been talking about this afternoon. You, you need to take care with existing investigations and with new investigations, the kind of care that everyone has been talking about here. Uh, uh, and, and, and make uh, careful decisions, explain to the career people why you're making the decisions and adhere to the principle that you are only going to prosecute someone if you have admissible evidence that uh, will have the likelihood of establishing uh, a conviction. I, I do want to add something else with respect to what I think I heard the tail end of, and that's uh, the career people. I think we need to also think about the investigators, uh, the people at the uh, FBI and the Marshal Service, uh, the DEA, uh, the Secret Service, etc. Those investigators have a lot of power themselves, and we get back to the kinds of adult supervision you need in connection with initiating an investigation or deciding to go forward with it or deciding either to prosecute or to, to, to decline. So this training and this uh, preparation for the kinds of decisions that have to be made needs to be extended to the investigators. They're very important here because they get invested in these cases too. And if a case is going to be declined, they need to understand why it's being declined. I'm going John, to open. John, may, may, yes, I just make, may I just make one point? I, exactly. I, I think um, one of the things that um, is hovering over all this that, that um, is worth noting is that the, the main checks on executive abuse are political, not legal. And a big part of the problem that we're dealing with here is Congress doesn't really do its job anymore as well as it should in terms of oversight. And as a result, it, it's kind of co-opted the department into doing not just the kind of criminal investigations that we would always do in a corruption context, but also more broadly speaking, um, abuse of power investigations. And I, and I think it's uh, it, it's come up in a number of, it certainly came up in the Nixon impeachment. It came up uh, in, in, the, in the Trump impeachment uh, for sure. A lot of what's in the nature of abuse of power is not violations of the criminal code. And ordinarily, we investigate to see if there's a, if there's a Title 18 or some other penal offense. If there's not, we can't prove it. It's, you know, we don't have a probable cause or at, at whatever stage, and then we don't have enough to make a case. We're done. You know, we, we dismiss the case and we move on to the next thing. Um, I, I think the department's gotten a lot of pressure from Congress to get enmeshed in politics because Congress does not 
do the kind of oversight that it needs to do. And as a result, we're getting the Justice Department is getting pulled into a lot of investigations where in ordinary criminal law contexts, it wouldn't proceed with those investigations. And I don't know exactly what you uh, what you do about that, but you know, some of this stuff, I, I think Attorney General Barr has said from the beginning of his, this current go round in the job that the way to get politics out of the department and the department out of politics is if we get brought into something, we look, if there's a criminal violation, you know, you pursue it in good faith. If there's not, then we're done. And there's got to be some better way to investigate abuse of power. So I'm going to open us, uh, the panel up to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, I have uh, a number that have, have shown up here um, and, and see someone identifying themselves as Christopher Green with their hand raised. Um, if you're taking, if you want to ask a question, obviously you need to uh, use the raise hand button in the lower uh, middle screen. Uh, and then uh, when I call on you, uh, you'll need to dial star nine uh, to, to ask your question. Uh, so, Mr. Green, um, uh, if you're on, uh, uh, what's your question for the panel? So I'm not on the phone, uh, but I think uh, I think you can hear me. So, yes, we can. Okay, it seems to me that prosecutors' offices have a pretty good uh, fit. Okay, I seem to have been muted. Okay, so it seems like prosecutors are a lot like out of control administrative agencies. And I wonder what all of you think about the idea of applying something like Overton Park or State Farm or just you know the, the requirement that prosecutors explain themselves. Uh, it might not be to a court, but to somebody, uh, something like that kind of review, applying that to prosecutorial discretion in general. Um, well, Mr. Green, when you ask the question about explaining yourself, give me a give me a for instance uh, that that you're thinking of that that maybe the panel can um, uh, address uh, more uh, directly. So, I mean, it seems like you have you always have a question. You are pursuing these goals, but at what cost? So, at what point do these uh, investigations become uh, just absurd, going after people for technical violations that aren't can possibly. Uh, be worthwhile. Uh, so, and that seems similar to the question, do you want I-40 to go through Overton Park uh, in 1971? And they ultimately decided, no, the Memphis Zoo is important enough. We're going to make I-40 go around. And they just had to explain themselves. So prosecutors don't generally have to explain themselves. Uh, they can just, you know, decide to prosecute or decide not to prosecute. Um, and they're, they seem erratic uh, in ways that uh, the EPA and the uh, uh, other administrative agencies often seem erratic. So I'm just wondering if one of the measures, one of the ways that we use to control administrative agencies might be useful as applied to prosecutors too. So I hope that helps. Okay, uh, fair enough. I volunteer from the panel want to take this yeah I, I, i'll just say I, I think what prosecutors do is different because we're protecting the presumption of innocence so you can't really explain yourself very often without getting into what became the big problem in the hillary clinton case which is going public with um evidence against people who are presumed to be innocent and um as far as checking what the, the Justice Department does, that's what the internal rungs of supervision and congressional oversight are for. And then, well, and then internally, in most U.S. attorney's offices, there is an ongoing review process, or there should be, during the investi investigation so that the prosecutor has to check in on a regular basis to give status updates and to talk about the facts and how things are being developed. And then you get back to the, the need for adult leadership. If, if it's a case that, doesn't, that isn't a crime, uh, it, it then needs to be stopped immediately. 
Um, but I, I agree that, the, and there are strong policy reasons for not walking out and announcing an investigation and talking about it. This is why we declined, because then you're implicating people that aren't being charged, and 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 uh, uh, that needs to be kept confidential. If I can just add here, John, um, that's a really good question. I, I think one way of answering it is to say that prosecutors do have to explain. They explain by having to secure a grand jury indictment, you know, from a grand jury. That's explaining that they have sufficient evidence to meet the necessary standard, probable cause, and you know, the belief that they'll be able to secure conviction at trial. But your point, your question goes to the, a very valid point of, okay, what about explaining which cases you decide to bring and which cases you don't decide to bring? And I think we've just identified some structural obstacles to doing that in the criminal process because the department doesn't and shouldn't say anything about anybody who was investigated and against whom a case was not brought. And so that makes it hard to then compare the facts of that case against the case for a person against whom a case was brought. So it's just, it, it's structurally sort of difficult, but that, that goes back to some of the oversight mechanisms that I think John was alluding to. I mean, you have congressional oversight, you have the inspector general, and as you know, the inspector general at DOJ in particular is very strong um, and uh, very, you know, they, they don't block it looking at any decision uh, the department makes no matter what level. You've got the uh, Office of Professional Responsibility that reviews what lawyers do within the Justice Department. So there's a good bit of supervision looking at all aspects of practice, but in particular looking at whether politics intrudes in the decision making. Um, next question, I'd like to ask Kelly Shackelford, who's raised, uh, uh, raised a hand here to uh, pose their question to the panel. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is, I thought one of the worst sort of perception of justice issues over the past few years was sending 25 to 30 heavily armed officers to arrest Roger Stone, who's 80 and lives alone with his elderly wife. Uh, who makes that kind of decision? And, and are there any consequences for that kind of abuse and contacting CNN ahead of time to have them film it? That, that seemed way over the top. And I was just curious. Well, who wants to take that one on? Uh, let me ask the question a little bit less uh, pejoratively and, and case specifically. In terms of how a warrant uh, gets served and executed, uh, and, and obviously we've seen historically uh, situations of criticism of, of uh, perp walks um, and, and other types of of uh, behaviors uh, that that put the uh, the accused, I guess, in a in a difficult spot. Um, how do we how do we weigh that against obviously the need for uh, law enforcement safety in the execution of a search warrant? Who makes those decisions, and uh, to what degree is the questions posed and the assumptions that you know uh, uh, fair, which is that in a white collar case with an individual who uh, has no uh, known prior criminal history. Uh, to what degree does uh, can it can the uh, means used uh, be, um, I guess, um, too much and uh, undermine actually the perception that the person is being treated fairly in the way in which the uh, uh, execution of the warrant is uh, is being done. Anyone? Uh, I, I would just say, in in my experience, uh, the FBI is and whatever agency it is that you're you're dealing with. Here it was the FBI, but um, it, it's sometimes other agencies. They're obviously very significantly involved. I would say, in my experience, more significantly involved than the uh, than the U.S. Attorney is in. Uh, Assessing the risk of whatever operation you're talking about, whether it's uh, you know serving a, a search warrant, I guess is what we're or an arrest warrant. Um, and my inclination, for what it's worth, was always to defer to the agency 
because they're the ones who are, number one, they're better at assessing these risks than, than the lawyers are, generally speaking. Uh, and also, you know, they're the ones who have to go out and do the operation. Um, again, mistakes are going to be made because they're, they're always made. And I, I'm always a little bit um, hesitant to, to comment on investigations. I always felt in my own investigations that I generally knew something that uh, the public didn't know and that I couldn't say. And that if every if I was able to reveal that, people would have uh, understood it a little better. It's true that sometimes there are things that are done that are over the top, but a, a lot of times um, when there's a when there's a show of force, it's done actually to prevent um, bad things from happening and accidents from happening, rather than uh, uh, to maximize the uh, the embarrassment of, of or the danger. Let me uh, remind everyone about the CLE password. Uh, let me call on Carlo Westjohn, who had a question. Uh, Ms. Westjohn, I think you may be muted. All right, I'll move on to uh, Mark Lamb. Uh, Mr. Lamb, are you able to uh, pose your question? I am. <clears throat> uh, can you all hear me? We can, yes, sir. So my question was specifically about the application uh, of switching prosecutor's protection from absolute to a qualified immunity. And a lot of the conversation has gone around the internal protections that are, are listed within uh, DOJ and, and uh, the Office of the Inspector General for misconduct, but there have been instances of prosecutorial misconduct that I think would, and, and we, we grant qualified immunity to police officers who have to make, you know, sort of life and death by the second decisions. What would be the argument against uh, qualified immunity for prosecutors who make a deliberate uh, and intentional uh, act of misconduct. All right. Well, who wants to volunteer for uh, the question of uh, prosecutorial uh, immunity? Um, I'll I'll start for one second and just say this. I think that. Um, when it comes to intentional misconduct, uh, which would fall within uh, the question of, of potential relaxation, first of all, very hard, high bar, right, to, to prove uh, that a prosecutor was not was acting in complete bad faith. And uh, frankly, those are the cases that are the most egregious. They are probably the most infrequent. Um, I think, in my experience, at least. Uh, far more often are the cases where the prosecutor did not in, act in uh, complete bad faith, but, but may have been very misguided. <laughs> um, and um, there ha certainly have been some noted investigations of prosecutorial decision making. I can think of one during my tenure in the department in which a federal prosecutor was ultimately indicted. Uh, for decisions uh, that he made in conjunction uh, with a terrorism investigation. Uh, he was acquitted at trial, notably. Um, uh, obviously, the consequence of reducing uh, immunity means uh, it's usually a boon for uh, uh, malpractice insurers, and it, it certainly means uh, a greater level of uh, potential collateral actions against prosecutors. And um, Obviously, as a policy matter, uh, what you would have is presumably greater risk and slightly more risk-averse behavior amongst prosecutors. Uh, at least that's my observations on it as a, as a technical matter uh, uh, as, or as a, as a general matter rather than as a, a pure uh, legal matter. But I think it would take, obviously, an act of Congress uh, to change uh, that standard as it pre presently exists. I think also... Um... Michael Mukasey, I think also that um, fear of either a civil judgment 
or a criminal prosecution um, is not the principal deterrent to prosecutorial misbehavior. Uh, loss of professional stature and loss of a professional license is, and there's no immunity from that. Uh, so I think that that usually operates um, as it should. Okay, uh, we've got time for one more question and then we're going to close. Uh, Mr. Gilmore, uh, James Gilmore, if, you've, uh, if you could pose your question quickly, please. Sure, I, can I be heard? I think I can. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm uh, Jim Gilmore. I'm an ambassador over here in Vienna, Austria. So I'm a lot later than you are right now. But um, I was also a defense lawyer, a prosecutor and an attorney general. And uh, I, th I thought I might point out there are checks and balances on this uh, system. Uh, you know, the, first of all, my experience is the judges are watching you all the time uh, to make sure that you're not guilty of misconduct or impropriety. And second, uh, the press is always looking to see if there's some abuse of uh, authority because they love to print that stuff. And then, uh, they, so they'll be looking for you. And then third, and most importantly is the bar and the ethics because you're still an officer of the court and if you are guilty of misconduct there's nothing scarier than the bar coming and looking over it i'm not sure about whether 1983 would apply as a check and balance on uh on impropriety of, of use of discretion and I, I just don't know whether that would apply in a case like this which i guess is a my question is whether that's a, a fourth check and balance I think it, it is theoretically, uh, but again, uh, in my experience, when asked by clients to uh, uh, about what can be done about uh, to vindicate the, uh, the uh, what they perceive as the injustices of the investigation itself, uh, even either either with a declined investigation or acquittal, uh, that the 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 bar uh, the bars to pursuing the prosecutors individually are extraordinarily high. Uh, I think Judge Mukasey is right though. These are all high achievers. They don't like to lose and uh, uh, there, there does tend to be professional consequences for, for losing. I regret that we don't have more time. We're at the bottom of the hour. Uh, and and I, I wanna thank, thank each of the, our panelists here. I wanna thank the audience for their attention. Uh, and uh, a reminder that uh, the next convention event, which is a discussion of, quote, regulatory practice and oversight in 2021 and beyond, will begin at 3.45 p.m. Thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, have a great week.